So hello, Dr. Joe. It's so lovely to see you again. It feels almost as if you're here in Croatia with us again. I wish I was in Croatia. <laughs> we wish as well. It's been almost three years since you last been here, uh, but it's really wonderful to have you online. And uh, thank you so much for being generous with your time. We know you're very busy and for taking part in Planetopia's online conversations with our authors. So not only in the past three years, but especially in the last year, a lot has changed globally and people are just searching for inspiration, for encouragement, for some sort of meaning for all that's happening and especially tools and uh, methods that can help them help us, not them help us. And what yes. better person, author and researcher to talk about that inspiration, motivation and knowledge than you. So really looking forward to it. Oh, thank you so much, Blaster. So I'd like to perhaps start this conversation with, with a question, if there is a lesson or maybe lessons that you have learned during uh, this year, personally in your work, in your community. Yes, well, I think, you know, right before the global pandemic, uh, our community and what, what I'm so proud of, uh, uh, the students in our community is that we're doers, you know, everybody, is engaged in changing their inner world to see what type of effects are produced in their outer world. And we've had such incredible um, research to show that you can change your gene expression, you can lengthen your life, you could change your way your brain works, the way your heart works, you can change the energy around uh, your body. Uh, we've, we've, we've measured so many things, uh, strengthen your immune system, uh, it's so important for people, I think, to understand the truth about their bodies uh, and uh, the truth about uh, our capacity to heal. So our, we have great research to show what's possible. And we have a lot of testimony from people around the world that have changed their health, changed their lives, have created mystical experiences, healed from the past. And I think evidence is the loudest voice. And so we've had great momentum and this hiatus um, from the type of work that we've done in running large events around the world, I think it's a good message for all of us to really get very clear about applying these principles uh, uh, to, to ourselves and, and see if we could begin to produce effects in our own personal lives. So I've seen it kind of like a break from uh, the busyness that everybody has been involved in. But I do think that it's an important time to question. It's important time to question everything from mm -hmm. politics to education, to journalism, uh, to the environment, uh, uh, to the economy. It's just an important time for us to demand a greater understanding about the truth, about uh, the way this world mm -hmm. is, is functioning. And I think one of the great things I've learned in the last six months is that you can't rely on anybody else but yourself. Uh, it's really just up to us uh, to ask ourselves the bigger questions and come up with the answers. And I think those answers uh, truly come from within. Great. And it's uh, you mentioned uh, questioning everything that's going on around us. And I think that includes questioning our own beliefs and one of, one of the beliefs is around our resilience. Are we resilient enough in our bodies? Are our bodies resilient, our minds, our hearts? What's your take on that? Are we equipped? Well, I mean, I think we come with all the neurological and biological machinery to be creators of our lives. I think the environmental pressures that all of us are experiencing means that we have to take this understanding to a whole nother level. And <clears throat> the idea of resilience is, it's not that you react to someone or something. The first question is how long you react to something or someone because it's the long-term effects of those hormones that push the genetic buttons that begin to weaken the organism. But one of the things in our work that we teach around resilience is this concept called self-regulation. To catch mm -hmm. yourself when you're emotionally reacting in fear and anxiety and anger and aggression, those are great ways to program people. If you, if you put them in a state of stress or put them in a state of survival, 
uh, people accept, believe, and surrender to information more readily. And, and I think there's a distinction that has to be made where we have to rise above uh, that. And we can't, we can't solve those problems in those emotional states because it's those emotional states that have actually created those problems. So resilience is our ability to not only shorten our emotional reactions, the chemical responses, but to stay conscious and aware and do it when we don't feel like doing it and doing it so that we get back into the right state. And that's the tools that we wanna use in our lives. And we've gone through great measures in this work in our week long events and teaching people how to be resilient emotionally and to in the moment where they're feeling like they're falling from grace to make a greater choice and do that not not just in our week-long events, but to do that in your life because resilience is your body's ability to recover after it has been weakened in some way. And if you keep weakening it with your responses to your environment, well, it makes sense you become more of a victim to your environment. And the more reactionary you are to the conditions in your world, the more susceptible you are to things in your environment from a macroscopic scale to a microscopic scale. And and when people start to understand that fear weakens their immune system, mm -hmm. that aggression and anger and hostility weakens their immune system. Um, I think people, when they start understanding it, wow, I, I have to go about this in a different way. I think uh, people are starting to wake up around the world and I think they're demanding to understand the truth and they want the truth. And, and uh, I think it's a great time in history where everybody's awakening to some degree. So just, just to send the message clear, now is the time. Now is the time when we feel our weakest, when we don't feel like it, when we think, ah, oh, it's too much, it's overwhelming, just to go and do the work. Uh, you, you, everyone who knows you, uh, knows that you put a lot of emphasis on heart and uh, brain coherence. And you've been doing a lot of research and if you could share some insights from the latest research that could be useful for our <clears throat> listeners and viewers to know. Sure, I mean, the formula that we've come up with, uh, we've been studying the brain and the heart since uh, 2016, between 2010 and 2016. And we've gone and done extensive research. We have over 8,500 brain scans. We have thousands and thousands of uh, heart rate variability measurements and and we consider um, brain coherence and heart coherence as the greatest way to create more integration or order in our nervous system and and when we're living in stress and we're trying to control and protect everything in our lives our research shows that the brain gets very disorderly very disintegrated very incoherent because our attention span is shifting very quickly from one person to another object, to another thing, to another place. And each one of those elements has a neurological network in the, in the brain. So the arousal of the stress hormones begins to drive the brain into disorder and into a very aroused state. And that's when we are um, at our weakest point. That's when, when the brain is incoherent, uh, we're incoherent. And it turns out that the same mechanisms apply to the heart and the heart is the creative center. And it's our mm -hmm. center of creation of wholeness and oneness. It's the union of polarities. And our research shows that the emotions of uh, impatience and frustration and hostility and resentment cause the heart to beat in a very disorderly fashion and energy literally mm -hmm. leaves the heart. Mm -hmm. So we also know that when we can actually trade those emotions for elevated emotions. Even though our environment isn't telling us that anything great is happening out there, mm -hmm. if we can self-regulate and create those elevated emotions, you can develop a skill. And that still skill begins to create more balance in the heart. And we have beautiful research just in February of this year, just before mm -hmm. the lockdown, where we had our scientific team measuring and we have these great scans showing that when a person is truly in their heart, that, the, that the, the pulse of the heart, the rhythm of the heart when it's orderly is sending a very powerful wave of energy into the brain and it's causing the brain to get more creative. So there's a very strong 
interconnection between the brain and the heart. And when we feel those elevated emotions, we feel safe enough to begin to think about possibilities and create. So there's a strong correlation between the physiology of the heart and the physiology of the brain. By the same means, when the heart is beating orderly, it begins to emit a magnetic field that's up to three meters wide. So we now know that there's, an, there's information that we're emitting into the field because that energy is frequency and frequency carries information. And so if you have a coherent brain and our formula of brain coherence, when you're living in stress, you're narrowing your focus, you're over-focusing on your problems, on your, everything in your life. And, and that kind of narrow focus uh, weakens the brain function. So we've learned that by doing the opposite and teaching people how to not focus on anything material, but open their awareness and focus on nothing, that those different compartments of the brain that were once divided begin to synchronize. And what sinks in the brain links in the brain. So mm -hmm. when you combine a clear intention, which is a brain function with an elevated emotion, which is a heart function, um, you tend to have a Wi-Fi signal, you, you're hooked up to information from the field and teaching people how to regulate their brain waves. Uh, we have great research to show that our student body can do that really well. They know the terrain on how to move through those levels and they can get beyond their analytical mind. So to create something new in your future, you have to think about with your brain a new possibility. And it's not just enough to have that intention because without the fuel of an elevated emotion, we're not creating anything. So most people are waiting for their life to change so they can feel joy or love or gratitude. But that's kind of cause and effect. We're teaching people to cause and effect. So when the heart is coherent and it's, it's emitting a frequency and energy, then that frequency could carry information. And now you can lay the thought or the intention on that energy. And now you're broadcasting a new signature into the field. You're changing your energy. And it's that kind of coherence that's sending a very clear signal into the field. So when we're creating from the field instead of from matter, we don't have to go anywhere to get what we want. We're a magnet. Our heart tends to draw the experiences to us. So if you're going to believe in a future that you're imagining with all of your heart, you better learn how to open it and keep it activated. And if you are going to get clear on that vision of your future, if your brain is incoherent, you have no attention to put it on that future. And where you place your attention is where you place your energy. But in a week-long event, we see the majority of our uh, student body, the brain scans that we measure in a very short amount of time, by the second or third day, they've, they've understood the formula and they're able to practice it. And, and now they understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. And that makes the how a lot easier. Is there an order? Uh, first, you put your heart into coherence and then it takes your brain or you first you have to make your brain function a little bit better in order to influence the heart or does it happen like simultaneously? Well, <clears throat> that's a great question because most people would think it's one or the other, but really what we're doing is we're teaching people how to suppress the thinking neocortex, the analytical mind, the memory bank of the known self, the autobiographical self is stored in that artifact of everything you've learned and experienced. So by suppressing neocortical activity and slowing your brain waves down, we're actually entering the autonomic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system is the automatic nervous system. And, you know, when, you, when we were uh, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, changing in, changes in heart rate, changes in autonomic functions were left to mystics and yogis. But that's not the case any longer. You can teach people how to do that. So when you enter the autonomic nervous system, then it, you're not looking at the tail of the elephant or the trunk of the elephant. You're looking at the whole elephant. So you're able to self-regulate. And one of the side effects is heart coherence. One of the side effects is brain coherence. So for certain people, they can connect to their heart better. And that when they get into heart coherence, it tends to influence their brain. Mm -hmm. Other people get their brain coherent and then they can relax and slow their brain waves down and then they can focus on their heart. 
it, how you enter that cycle is just a function of um, um, a person's a person's preference. And and for me, I try never to do it the same way twice. <laughs> I think that's the key. <laughs> Uh, besides reading your books and rereading your books again and rereading your books again, which I have to say is your creation publisher, but on, not only because of that, but because of how important the knowledge and the information is, um, could you give to the viewers who are maybe entering your work, like few simple steps or things you, they could do tomorrow morning or tonight just to get going into that sure. direction? Well, the number one thing is, I think that we already know how to do this. This isn't something that uh, mm -hmm. is so outside of our reach. I think everybody has created something great in their life. They've all, everybody has done something where they've pushed themselves outside of their comfort zone and realized the dream, realized uh, a, a reality, and something has manifested for them. So we have the experience of what that takes. The word meditation literally means to become familiar with. So if you sat down and you said, okay, my personality creates my personal reality. And my personality is a combination of my thoughts, my behaviors, and my emotions. And if my personality creates my personal reality and I want to create a new personal reality, a new life, that means I got to change me. I got to change my personality. So to become familiar with the thoughts that you're thinking that are unconscious thoughts that you don't pay attention to, that you accept, believe, and surrender to be normal or accepted by you. The moment you start thinking about what you're thinking about, now you're no longer immersed in the biology of the programming that we have by thinking the same way. So if we begin to notice how we act, if we begin to pay attention to how we're feeling, the act of becoming so conscious of your unconscious self that you don't go unconscious again, that's a victory in one day. The voices in your head that say, I can, it's too hard, my life will never change, those thoughts are affecting your body on a daily basis. So then if you've been thinking those thoughts for 10 years and you have not been conscious of them, well, nervous cells that fire together, wire together. That's a, that's a hardwired program that you have to begin mm -hmm. to nature in some way. So if people truly wanted to change their life, then they would sit down and say, let me pick two or three thoughts that I wanna change. I'll write them down. How do I speak? How do I act in my day? Let me look at myself. Do I complain? Do I make excuses? Do I feel sorry for myself? Do I judge other people? Let me pick three things that I'm going to change about my behaviors. I'm going to write them down and I'm going to become so familiar with them, so conscious of them that I won't go unconscious and let them slip by my awareness unnoticed. Then you would say, what emotions do I live by every day? This is a tough one for people because most people... They're, they're so used to feeling guilty. They're so used to feeling bad. They're so used to suffering. They're so used to feeling unworthy that it feels like them. Now, the moment you start making the choice to change that, now all of a sudden, you got to stay conscious. So if you said, I'm not going to suffer, I'm not going to feel bad. And this is not about positive thinking. Mm -hmm. This is about overcoming the emotions that keep you connected to the past, you know, because if you're going to create a new future and you want, I don't know, abundance as an example or love, you can't bring unhappiness. Uh, you can't bring lack. That's, uh, that's the emotions of the past. So to overcome the emotions that keep you connected to the past is allowing you to begin to create a new future. And when we get to the point where we're no longer blaming our parents or our culture or our exes or whatever people do, and they get to that point where they take full responsibility for themselves and their lives, this is a different game now because they're not excusing themselves from it for anyone or anything. Now, this kind of personal change, the disentangling from those thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that are functioning like automatic programs 
the moment you can observe them, you're no longer the program now because you're conscious. You're only the program when you're unconscious. So this awakening process for most people, it's usually because of crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis. And we're saying, why wait for that? So, so if a person got really serious and said, let me write these things down, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to commit them to memory. They would be meditating to know thyself. Then if you said, okay, one day, one lifetime, I got one day to get it right. Groundhog day. How am I going to get it out? Okay. What thoughts do I want to fire and wire in my brain? And if you said, I'm going to put my attention and my intention on a new thought. And you began to focus your attention and with intention, firm intention, you began to decide what thoughts you do want to think in your brain. If you keep firing and wiring those thoughts, you're going to install the hardware. And if you do it enough times by repetition and they fire and wire together, now the hardware becomes a software program. And now you hear a new voice in your head that says, Vlasta, you can. That there's more possibilities than you're aware of. Um, come on, you can do this. That's, there's no mystery there. You, you install those circuits. And then if you said, okay, how am I going to act today? What, what would greatness look like today? How am I going to be with my coworkers? How am I going to be when I'm driving in my car? How am I going to be when I'm watching the news, when I'm, when I'm talking to my friends? And you began to close your eyes and in your mind rehearse mentally how you were going to be. There comes a moment, this is neuroscience now, where you're so present and so focused that the brain does not know the difference between the real life experience and what you're imagining in your mind. So the brain is typically a record of the past, an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced to this moment. But now, as you're rehearsing a new way of being, experience enriches the brain but you're not having the real life experience, you're imagining the experience. So now the brain is no longer a record of the past. Now it's becoming a map to the future because you're installing new circuitry. Now, if you keep doing it, you're priming your brain with new hardware. Repetition causes it to create a software program. And the next thing you know, you start acting like a happy person. Well, there's no mystery there. It's what people do all the time when they're musicians, when they're athletes when they're dancers when they're actors they're rehearsing in their mind and it's that act of rehearsal that begins to fire and wire those circuits so that becomes the platform and if you keep doing it it'll begin to become familiar to you and people will say why are you so happy and you'll say god i don't know i just feel happy and then here's the key can you teach your body emotionally what the future will feel like before it happens now, most people will say, well, I can't do that. Once I heal, then I'll be grateful. But the body is so objective that it does not know the difference between a real life experience that's creating an emotion and the emotion that you're creating by thought alone. So the body doesn't know the difference. So when you start feeling the emotions of gratitude and falling in love with the future and inspiration and joy, your body is believing it's in that future reality in the present moment. And if the environment signals the gene, and it does, and the end product of an experience in the environment is an emotion, you're actually signaling genes ahead of the environment and you're changing your body because genes make proteins. And now you're becoming that very person. So by overcoming the old self and then becoming a new self, you become so familiar with the old self, so conscious of the old self, you would never go unconscious again. And so conscious of the new self, so familiar with the new thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that you become that person. Then when you become that personality, then we should see your personal reality beginning to change around you. So ask yourself a simple question. Try it out as an experiment. 15 minutes, 20 minutes a day. Before I start, grab my cell phone, and go through my routine behaviors. Before I think about all my problems in the past, why don't I sit down and just ask myself this question? What is the greatest expression of myself? What, what am I going to give to the world today? What, what is the gift of me that I can give? And people who do this properly start to see those synchronicities, those serendipities, the coincidences, the opportunities that are coming to them. They're not going and getting them. They're a magnet uh, to that destiny. So 
I think just taking a little bit of time and investing in yourself uh, is investing in your future. And I think in order for you to believe in a new future, you got to believe in yourself. And when you believe in yourself, uh, you got to believe in a new future. So I think, I think people around the world are, are doing it and demystifying the process and trying it out as an experiment just to see if it works. That, that's what makes it fun. So have fun with it. So believing in yourself uh, would be a, a good first belief to install into our uh, software, <laughs> definitely. And uh, what came to my mind when you were talking is uh, the importance of that awareness of our ha habits, the power of our habits, which are really strong and our thoughts and our beliefs uh, out, even outside the time of meditation, uh, just during the day, just to snap out of it, from time to time, just, just go back and go back. It's not only the time to meditate, but it's what we do the rest of the day. No, this is an important uh, point because uh, you can't uh, get all heart centered in your meditation and then get on the freeway and start cutting people off or getting to work and start judging your coworkers. You, you went back to the old personality. We're doing the meditation at the beginning of our day to remind ourselves to stay conscious so conscious that you don't go unconscious in your day. That means then, if you start noticing that you're feeling some emotions, if you start thinking in familiar ways, that you catch yourself, take a moment and recalibrate. That's a victory. And those victories add up because if the alternative is you go unconscious and then it's six o'clock in the evening and you reacted to somebody at 11 o'clock in the morning, what happened between 11 and six? You are back into a series of programs. And so the discomfort that comes along with personal change and transformation, I want people to understand is a very healthy thing because the comfort of the known, the guilt, uh, the suffering, the pain, the familiar tracks in our brain that say, you can, it's too hard, you'll never change. How people speak. <laughs> when, when you get so clear that that will never cross your mind again or never get you back to that familiar state. The alternative is when you leave the familiar, you're leaving the known. And when you leave the known, you're in the unknown and there's no, you can't predict it, it's uncomfortable. And so most people, when they feel that discomfort, they go back to the same person again, because it feels familiar. I want people to understand in their meditations when they feel that discomfort, that they're actually doing their meditations right. That's, that's a good point, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, I, I, I guess you um, get this question asked a lot, but is there a meditation you would recommend for health and strengthening our immunity because it is the focus nowadays? Well, I, I, tell, I will tell you what we know. Okay. And, um, I can't tell you everything because we're working with some universities uh, right now in the United States, some prestigious universities that are studying our work. And I can tell you that you have all the ingredients inside your body to strengthen your immune system that fear weakens the immune system, pain weakens the immune system hostility and anger weakens the immune system. We took a group of people and we measured their cortisol levels, which is a stress hormone. Uh, and then we measured another chemical called immunoglobulin A or IgA. It's your body's natural flu shot. It's your body's defense against viruses and bacteria. It's actually better than any flu shot. And we make that naturally in our body. But when people live in stress and they're responding and reacting to everything in their outer world, the, the mobilization of all that energy for that danger, that threat that they're perceiving, the long-term effects robs our inner world for growth and repair. So as our stress hormones go up, our immune system goes down. Well, this just makes total sense. Well, how are you gonna make your immune system stronger without relying on some exogenous substance, some pills, some whatever. Well, it turns out that we took these people, 117 people, we measured their cortisol levels, we measured their IgA levels. And then in four days, we asked them three times a day to trade 
those limited emotions, so stress emotions for elevated emotions, gratitude, appreciation, care, love, kindness, and just open their hearts for about 10 to 15 minutes, two or three times a day. At the end of four days, their immune system, that IGA was up to 50%, on the average for every person. Now, if a pharmaceutical company could make your IGA levels go up by 50%, you would see it on every commercial during the news. And yet our body has its, this innate pharmacy uh, that begins to strengthen our immune system. So, so then so can what, you, what is- Can you again say how many times a day should we do it? It's like, sounds like 10 minutes per day to feel gratitude. It's not that much of an effort. It shouldn't be for such a wonderful effect. Yeah, I mean, but then again, you know, intellectually, it sounds really easy. You close your eyes and people go, what am I grateful for? <laughs> and they, they can't find, they can't make, they can't feel gratitude. And like, then they'll say to me, I can't, I, I can't feel that. And I say, well, what do you practice feeling? Because you are what you practice. Mm -hmm. So making the conscious effort to be grateful for the sun, to be grateful for hot water in your shower, to be grateful for a great cup of coffee, to be grateful to be at the table with your family, to be grateful for your health. These are all things that actually strengthen the living organism. And so, but if you're waiting for your environment to change so you can feel gratitude, you're hypnotized and conditioned into something changing out there before you could feel it. And Think about gratitude. It's such an interesting emotion. When you receive something or you're receiving something that's favorable, if something's happening to you that you like or something just happened to you that you really enjoyed, you feel this emotion called gratitude. So the emotional signature of gratitude means something just favorable happened to you. So if you start feeling gratitude every single day, your body as the unconscious mind is so objective that it's in the perfect state of receiving. The energy of gratitude is the energy of receiving. So then when you're living in a state of gratitude, the door is open energetically for you to begin to receive. And we see people who move into these states that all of a sudden their body, not only do their IGA levels go up, but there, there goes their cancer, there goes their diabetes, there goes their rheumatoid arthritis, there goes their MS, there goes their Parkinson's. The body's in a different state. It's, it's believing that the healing's happening to them and they're in the state of gratitude and they can accept, they can believe, they can surrender to thoughts that are equal to that emotional state. And that's exactly what it takes to program the autonomic nervous system to a different outcome. And it takes some effort. It takes some conscious decision to do it every day. And, and I liked what you said about uh focusing on on success it's not focusing on failure oh i've done it again i've come back to my old self no it's focus on but i came back to my new self again that's Just exactly correct counting the victories not counting the failures because failures or whatever we are going to call them uh well, are that's what, that's going to happen it's something to expect it's not like oh then well, i don't want to do the work well, the brain learns by mistakes and the yeah. brain learns by surprises and how many times do we have to forget before we finally say, I'm never gonna forget again? This is, when you remember, you're conscious. When you forget, you go unconscious. So for me, in my day, I'm like, I gotta remember, I gotta stay awake, I gotta stay conscious, I gotta stay present, I gotta stay aware. And this, this, is, this means then, if you're gonna stay conscious, it's gonna take more energy for you to do that. Mm -hmm. Because you can't have awareness without energy. You can't have consciousness without energy. So the moment your energy drops, it's very easy to go back and forget again. But when people do their meditations and they say, oh, my God, I wanted to get up, you know, and I wanted to quit. Mm -hmm. Well, when your body's been programmed to get up and go and you notice that it wants to get up and go and you go, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm the boss here. I said we're going to do this meditation. And you realize your body's on a program. And it's uncomfortable and it wants to check the, its emails and wants to check its texts and wants to call somebody and get busy. And you bring it back to the present moment. You're executing a will that's greater than the program and you should celebrate that as a victory. That's a victory. You mm -hmm. overcame 
you, you told the body, no, 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 you're not the mind today. I'm the mind. And then you notice you start feeling discouraged and impatient and angry. You're sitting there with your eyes closed and you notice that your body's getting agitated and you settle it back down into the present moment and you go a little further. That's a victory too. And as you overcome and as you overcome, as you overcome, you're going to become somebody else because you're telling the body it's no longer the mind, that you're the mind. And you are training the animal. And if you keep doing this enough times, just like training a dog, it will sit, it will stay, it will behave, and it will be present. And the moment that happens, the body liberates energy. There's a release of energy, particle to wave, matter, energy. There's, you, are, you are freeing yourself from those emotions of the familiar past or the predictable future that are the known and you're settling into the present moment, which is the unknown and you're comfortable in the unknown. Now you can create and where you place your attention is where you place your energy. And if you can be truly present, you've got a lot of energy. So there's, you're building your own field. Now you have energy to heal. Now you have energy to create a new life. There's energy there because you had to overcome some aspect of the limited self in order to create something new. And, and people need to be educated on that. That's why in our week long events, I'm, you know, I, I make our meditations sometimes go longer than people like. Why? Because I want to stretch them. I want to stretch them way outside their comfort zone. So when they go home and they do their meditation and it's, it's 45 minutes, they're going to be like, that was nothing. I could, I could be present. And then they're practicing being present. So when they're in their waking day, they're more conscious. And that's exactly what it takes to change. So when you said that we are building our energy, feel then it, our energy becomes stronger and we have enough energy to create is it our energy or is it combination that we are connecting with the energy of the field and it's the chemistry that happens between well two. that's a great question when you live in survival and you live in stress yeah you know, the stress hormones heighten the senses and we draw from this invisible field of energy surrounding our body and we turn it into chemistry. So our life force, our life field shrinks. Now, short term, no problem. The body can rest and repair. and We can build our own field. But if you keep doing that and, you, and the stronger the emotion you feel to some person or some problem in your life, the more you pay attention to it. So where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So you're giving your power away to that person or that problem. So a person sitting in their meditation and the emotions are coming up and they're lowering the volume of that emotion. Sooner or later, when they overcome that emotion, they're going to take their attention off that person or that problem. And they're going to draw energy back to them. So now they're building their own field. Now, that field is the field that's going to eclipse with the quantum field that's all around you. But if you have no field, it's like your phone with no... With no a signal you can't connect the the field is still there the wi-fi signal is still there but you don't have a signal to connect to so teaching people brain and heart coherence the rhythmic state of resonance that's going on in the brain and heart now can entrain to coherence in the unified field and it's the unified field that's causing order and, and synchrony in, in, their, in their nervous system. And, and now the resonance that can take place, is, it's being entrained. And now they're getting information now, no longer through their senses. <laughs> their eyes are closed. They're, you know, there's music in the background. They're sitting still. They're not eating. They're not smelling. They're not tasting. They're not moving around. They're not feeling. Now the brain is entrained and it can receive information from frequency because frequency carries information. Now... Now there's just an interaction that's taking place. And we've seen this now. We can actually predict it when it's going to happen on a brain scan. We can induce it and we can replicate it. In fact, at our last week-long event, we had 10 stations measuring uh, brain function during our, our, uh, each meditation. Three out of 10 people uh, in just about every meditation were having that connection. Like very profound, the arousal that they were having was ecstasy and bliss, way outside of normal. And so if three out of 10 people are having that, because they understand the formula, and there's 1,100 people in the room, well, there's at least 300 people in the room 
more and more that are having a similar experience. So um, it's that interaction of building your own field then that gives you the field to be able to connect. But the real question is how much of our waking day do we put our attention on matter and how much of our waking day do we put our attention on energy? So if you are unaware of the field, then it doesn't exist for you. Just like if you're unaware of your nose, it doesn't exist, but the moment you become aware of your nose, it's there, right? But it's always existed. So teaching people how to understand that this isn't just a myth, this energy is real. And when people start going after it with that kind of intention and they hook up to the field, <laughs> The interaction of what happens in the brain is huge. The brain goes into this high state of gamma brainwave patterns, not a little gamma, and a, an enormous amount of gamma. And the person is having an arousal. And the arousal is not fear. The arousal is not anger. The arousal is not aggression. The arousal is not pain. The arousal is ecstasy. They're interacting with this intelligent love. They're interacting with more wholeness, more order. And it's not coming from out there. It's not coming from a, an ice cream sundae. It's not coming from a shopping spree. It's not coming from a drug. It's something that's coming from within them. And now all of a sudden they're no longer as interested in what's going out there to create that feeling. They're looking inside, wow, it's in me. Now changes the game because now people know it's real. And the moment you have that experience and you know it's real, now you want more of it. It's, it's a wonderful thing that if we open ourselves and start or, and become a receiver uh, and uh, connect with ener this energy field, the, the quantum field, the unifying field, it's the knowing that we are not alone and that we will be supported in this process. Um, and I wanted to ask you uh, just quickly, I, I think you ask, get that asked a lot again. That can happen in any type of meditation you do. It's like yes, blessing so God the energy centers often people use for health issues. Is there a yeah. meditation you would recommend or it doesn't happen in any meditation? Well, I think like for me personally, I go to extensive measures to do it as many ways as I can. I mean, we have small little meditations that create brain and heart coherence that will be instrumental for a lot of people and they're not too long and they can, they can do those. Other people are fighting a more uh, serious health condition, the blessing of the energy centers and knowing how to put your attention in each one of those centers and the space around them. Those are, those are all under the control of the autonomic nervous system. And you can, you can enter these little circuit boards and begin to reprogram each one of those little mini brains and the, the hormones and glands that are associated with it. Uh, that's another way to do it. Uh, some people um, like to do uh, the breath that we teach and then they like to recondition their body to different emotions and, and they practice that. And so they can feel those elevated emotions and that begins to change their energy. So uh, I have seen Velasta people heal uh, from the craziest uh, meditations, just it was, it was their time. It was just their time. I mean, you would say, you know, you come to a week long event and you see someone with stage four cancer stand on the stage and say, I don't have cancer anymore. And you think, oh, well, she was lucky. Or, well, how did that happen? But what you don't know is that she never missed a day of her meditations for the last nine months. And it was her moment. It wasn't really the meditation, it was just she got to that point where it all made sense to her, it all lined up, everything came together, she got out of the way, surrendered, connected, and that energy moved through her and wholeness was the side effect. So it's, it's, the, it's the journey of awakening that matters the most. And I think that's, uh, you ask those people that have healed, they'll tell you, it was just the constant, every time I showed up to do my meditation, I had to show up and believe that there was a future. You stop doing your meditations. Just you stop believing in that future. You just don't believe it any longer. If you believed it, you would never miss a day, right? So you mentioned it's a question of time and I, I wish we would have a limitless amount of time to talk to you, at least in this 
three-dimensional world, who knows, maybe we'll uh, continue our conversation on some other level in some other way. Uh, I would like to ask you many questions, of course, but uh, as a sort of closure, would like to know what's your biggest motivation for the work that you do? Wow, one of the biggest lessons I learned last uh, since the global pandemic is uh, my highest value is our community. I mean, there's no greater joy uh, in witnessing or being a part of someone's personal change and transformation. It's, it is, I think we're wired as a species to care for one another, to give to one another, to heal one another, to shine for one another, to inform one another. I think that's a high value for me. And when, when all of this happened, I realized that we have such an amazing community of people that do the work and, and uh, I'm inspired on a personal note to see people who haven't missed a day in doing their meditations and they're, and they're creating wonder in their life and magic in their life. And the world could be doing whatever it's doing and they're having a whole different experience. Their mystical moments are t taking them realms they just never knew existed. And, and I think that's the door out, you know? So, so one of the things for me personally is I'm inspired by our community. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, they inspire me to do the work and uh, they inspire me to keep learning. They inspire me to keep teaching. They inspire me to, to think of new ways to saying things, saying things that may help people hear it in a different way. Um, so what an amazing time to be alive. Um, this is certainly game time. You know, we're out of the bleachers and we're on the field. And uh, I think community, if you have like-minded people that are supporting your greatest good, supporting and believing in the same thing that you believe in, not in a irrational way, but in a way that people understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. So that when they sit down to do it, the how becomes really fundamentally important for them. So our community are, are just a group of doers. And for me, um, I'm a practical person. If it doesn't make sense to me and I can't use it in some way, then uh, it has no real value. So our community, I think they do the work because um, they don't want the magic to end. I know you have a great community worldwide and you have a great community here in Croatia. On behalf of all of them, I want to thank you for this wonderful conversation. It has been a little over 45 minutes of pure joy and gratitude. And I count this as my daily meditation while I try to do another one as well. <laughs> Uh, thank so you. thank you for that and I hope to see you either here or somewhere close uh, next year. Week-long events I saw are announced for 2021. Yes, we're going we're gonna to do our best to get out there in the world and empower people uh, with a message uh, to, to live a, a great life. Thank you for that. Thank, thank you. you.